Welcome everyone to the second day of the Melbourne Indigenous Arts Festival and the beginning of a weekend of talks with firstly writers, Indigenous writers, and of course we've got the visual arts talks tomorrow um, that I hope you turn up for. And of course this is part of Melbourne Conversations, which happens all throughout the year. And of course it is only right and fitting that this weekend we are hearing from amazing Indigenous writers, poets, rappers, Ooh. and um, they have to have a, an MC just to kind of look like there's some order. So that's a fitting um, introduction from me. My name is Kylie Belling. I'm a Yorta Yorta woman, born and bred in Melbourne. Love it, miss it when I go away, have to come back. And how beautiful be to be able to look out at the river. Of course, you probably can't now that you've moved down, but you know, it's there. Um, of course, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are on here today, those of the Kulin Nation, and I'm sure you're gonna be hearing that and you have heard it many, many times. It is something that we must always do. And I encourage all people to do that wherever they're in a public forum. Okay, so here we are. Now we've got three of our um, poets here of many, many poets that we have in our communities all across Australia, but most particularly in, Victor in Victoria. Let me first introduce them, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, women first, we have the wonderful Kim Walker here. Yes. <laughs> Clapping before I even tell you that she is an Indigenous poet who writes about her feelings on issues faced by all Indigenous people, and you will hear that in her poetry. And she will, of course, introduce herself as well. John Harding is a director, actor, and he, I think he wrote this one, one of Australia's leading playwrights, with 11 productions staged and broadcast locally and abroad. A founding member, yes. <laughs> a founding member of Elbidgeries Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Theatre Cooperative, the longest running Aboriginal theatre in the country. He works in the hope of creating a space for Indigenous people on the Australian stage. And, you know, you, you actually done that, Johnny, and you continue to do so, so well done. <laughs> you better get a new aim, buddy. <laughs> Tony Birch is a published short fiction, poetry and creative non-fiction writer who has also worked as a writer and curator in collaboration with photographers, filmmakers, artists, and anyone who cares to collaborate with you, Tony? If they put the money up. That's right, it's all about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I thought that we would begin, well, we've actually begun, or continue to, by hearing from the poets themselves and their work, and we will go from there. So I'm asking each of the poets to begin by, uh, okay, I'll, basically I'll say you've got 10 minutes. How many poems can you fit into that? <laughs> and then we'll go back and dissect the work, talk about the work, hear your inspirations for your work, and then perhaps open it up to the floor. How's that sound? That's good. That's Wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's first hear some poems from the amazing Miss Kim Walker. Thank you. First off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Kulin Nation, both the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong, on whose land we're on. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge all the Indigenous people in the audience. The first poem I'm going to read was the poem that actually um, got me to start publishing poems. Um, Lou Bennett put music to it, and it's on the first two albums of Titus. And if it wasn't for Lou and Lisa Blair, I wouldn't be sitting here today and sharing my poetry. <laughs> so this is for both of them. The Spirit of the Winter Tree. As I walk on this land of my people's dreaming, I can feel the spirit of the winter tree. As the winter season takes her children, oh, I'm fading. <laughs> it will leave her naked under the winter sky. Yet she still holds her head up high and maintains a sense of dignity, for the spirit of the land gives her the strength to hold her identity. And it's from the land that my people will gather their strength of identity, for the land is our mother who will hold us close in her arms, 
For like the trees, you'll take from us our children and our way of life. You force your values on us, treating us like second-graded citizens. As the seasons continue their endless cycle, like trees, we will flower with a stronger spirit and identity with each new day, for we will both adapt and still maintain our sense of being. And like the tree, you can never take away our spirits, for it remains in our souls. We will not wear a mask of another culture and pretend we're something else. The next two poems sort of go hand in hand. Um, they were written for the Stolen Gen. And the first one's for the children. Hear the cries of the children from yesterday. Hear the cries of the children as they're torn from their mother's breast. Taken from the family, the only real love a child should know. Stripped of their identity and culture, not knowing where they belong. Hear the cries of the mothers as their hearts and souls are broken into pieces for the one of their children. Feel the pain as they are sent into a state of shock, never knowing if their children may return. Hear the cries of the children as they're placed in environments so cold and unloving, abused by the hands of strangers, being silenced from their families and culture. Hear the cries of those children trying to find their way back as adults, discovering their lost identity and culture, searching for their families and missing links in their lives, trying to discover where they fit in. Hear the cries of my people asking why should our children be put through this uncaring pain when their childhood should have been a time of games, joy, exploring and discovery. Hear those cries of sorrow and pain from yesterday as those who are lost find their way home, let us protect our children of today so they never cry those tears of sorrow or feel the pain like our children from yesterday. <laughs> this next one is for the mothers and fathers. Mothers and fathers are crying. Mothers are grieving, fathers are searching for the children that were created from their spiritual love for one another. The children that mirror the spiritual beauty of our mother's land in a virgin state before she is raped and abused by strangers. Mothers are crying, fathers are screaming in desperation and frustration, asking where have they taken them? Sending the children's names floating upon the spirit of the wind as she glides across our mother's land, calling the children back home. Mothers are trembling, fathers are embracing. As the children have been stolen, return home, finding their identity and discovering where they belong. Standing united with our people as one in the struggle of recognition of our mother's land and the injustice done to our people. And this is my last one. And this is for all our kids out there. I see them quite lost when they're out on the streets and that. And I think, you know, it's pride in our identity. Stand tall and strong. Standing tall and strong like our grandfathers and grandmothers from long ago. The struggle we face is the same. Recognition of our cultural identities determination of our family's futures, management of our own cultural business. Stand tall and strong, my sister, my brother, especially for our people who stood before us and the children who may follow. Let's make a difference for the future, for it may be your child or mine that suffers. I want my grandchildren never to face the struggle. I want them to be proud of where they came from and know who they are without fear to have their identity, to be recognised, never know what prejudice is. Stand tall and strong, my children. Be proud of who you are. Shout out loud, I'm a black fella. For the ones who have stood this ground before you have paved the way for you to be recognised. Stand tall and proud, my people. Let's all unite as one. Reconcile any differences. Recognise each other 
for who we are. For only as one can we overcome bigotry from another culture. Take my hand. Together we walk tall and strong. As one, we change the ways of the past which brought us here today. Create a better future so the children from our cultures are recognised for who they are in the struggle to determine their future. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next. I'll, I'll get up there. Oh, you get up there. <laughs> yes. Sorry. I'm Firstly, thanks for coming. Uh, I was, I, I was going to read um, some new ones and then I thought, nah, I'll read some old ones. Um, one particularly because I heard Tony was on the panel and we were at Melbourne Uni together, but the only difference was I was getting paid to be there and he was paying to be there. <laughs> so this one's, this one's actually for memory of, uh, well, the good old days at Melbourne Uni. Um, <clears throat> it's to all the Melbourne Uni college students, past and present. Graduates and lecturers, they made it sound like Luna Park. Clubs and pubs and light and govs a good time three-year lark, but apparently I didn't fit in with any clique or crowd. To the politics chutes, you're not committed enough. To the philosophers, you're too loud. To the radicals, I was too determined. To the intellectuals, too slow. To the ski society, I was a bit of a dad because I wouldn't have a go. The bushwalkers club bored me because I'm not into tents. The Dungeons and Dragons Club invited me once, but I had too much bloody sense. The ALP Club caught me unpositioned, and the young libs, they just ignored me. The musical youth called me tone deaf. The gay society never saw me. But all this gave me time to study. My nonconformity did not crack. But to this day, I ponder curiously, was it all because I am black? <laughs> Um, on a lighter note, <laughs> um, I went to the tent embassy a couple of weeks ago and um, we stopped at Panola uh, to have a little refresh, refreshment and uh, there was this Italian fellow there and he was heading to the embassy and he'd never been to Canberra uh, and he said, how do we get there? I thought, what a great idea for a poem. So this is called, how do we get there? <laughs> So I said to him, well, it depends which direction you're coming from. To head towards Canberra, you go straight through the 240-year bypass, then you'll hit a few suburbs you have to pass through. Colonisation, genocide, oppression, then you hit Mission Central. Pass through the Stolen Generations, that's a T intersection. When you hit the Reconciliation Roundabout, you just keep going round and round and round. <laughs> then there's a bit of nothing on the highway for a while. Then you'll start to see some fireworks. You slow down. You're almost there, brother. Slow down then. You're almost there. Then you just follow the flags. That's where it starts. Now you're at the beginning. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's for all black men who have experienced what I've experienced, which sometimes is just walking down the street. You seem to scare all the white women. <laughs> <laughs> just walking home. <clears throat> this, is, this is called Reclaim the Night. The bus rattles so hard, his big toe pops in and out of his Reebok as he sees the outline of the shoe repair shop marking the beginning of his street through a rainy window on the bus. As his finger touches the bright orange button to signal his departure, a buzz goes off before he presses it, looking up like gunslingers, a soldier of the streets eyes off a nurse who carries her Myers and David Jones bags, not Smith and Westons. His unlit street will be their mental battleground. Her fear uneases him, impales him against a butcher shop window where he stops to reassure her he is not following. He cannot even walk home without being made to feel like a criminal. Fuck this, he utters teeth clenched. He walks behind her, 
his long skinny legs bring the rest of him beside her. He's, g'day Florence, wrenches a nervous smile from her as she nods and struggles with her bags. Do you want a hand? An electric fry pan, light but awkward, is gently pressed against his wind cheater. 200 years of swinging like the rusty gate he knees open to reveal her home. As she waves him off, a tear of shame from her face hits the electric fry pan. The night is momentarily reclaimed for her and he is free to walk home at his own pace. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this is my attempt at a sound poem. <laughs> 1992. Um, now you've got to close your eyes and you've got to imagine you're a British convict, they put you on a ship and you're coming here and it's whatever it was, 1788 or whatever it was, the first fleet and that's the history of also of our people. It's called Alien Nation. Exploration, flotation, interaction, desecration, mutilation, segregation, Cattle stations, sheep stations, demonstrations, rejection, degradation, suppression, trivialization, dehumanization, transportation, terrorization, discrimination, fictionalization, frustration, forced correction, penalization, wrong direction, incarceration, annihilation, frustration, desperation, separation, Victimization, reconciliation. Welcome to my alien nation. <clears throat> what are you crying about, Kai? <laughs> here's one. Here's one that I wrote many. Which one I prepared earlier, but I wrote many years ago. <laughs> and it was just about we did a NADOC. It was actually when my mum was alive, and we did a NADOC march down here. And um. Uh, from Fitzroy to, to the city, <clears throat> we used to march to Parliament House, and it's called the longest walk. And this is I dedicated this to Vicky Walker. Um, he looked after my mum. Um, a sea of black faces wind their way down Collins Street, while curious white faces look on in blind defeat. See red, black, and yellow. That's the colour for today. The cops are in confusion. One even says, "G'day." <laughs> The chant is cursed and the curse is chanted. The one thing that we long for granted. Speech is screamed at Parliament steps, but within the crowd, the strength and depth of youth surges through. What do we want? When do we want it? And what do we got? Rings out louder than any tram's commotion. Pride, anger and enjoyment mix in a cascade of crowd emotion. Trying to achieve equality is the blacks of the 80s task. A fair go for the blacks on the land you tax. Is that really too much to ask? Thank you. Um, thank you, Johnny. Um, just a couple of things at the start, um, just particularly for blackfellas from interstate. Um, Fiona Foley, make sure you take her on a, an op shop tour while she's here so you can get a new jacket. Um, Rada Roberts, Mervyn Bishop, um, I see John Mundine up the back, the rappers, all the hangers on, it's great to be in Melbourne. Um, and one of the things that Kim mentioned and, and Johnny mentioned, um, there's a connection between all of us here and it is Lisa, and I don't think any of us would be here doing what we're doing now if we hadn't met and been welcomed creatively and emotionally by Lisa for some of us 20, 30 or more years ago. And each time I read, I get a strong sense of, of her presence. Um, I'm just gonna read one poem, but it's a long one. Um, I was asked to debate Keith Winshuttle on Late Night Live with Philip Adams in, in 2004 and it was during that sort of period of the so-called history wars and although most people in the audience and those who listen pretty much said that we won the night through reason and truth and dignity, 
I felt at the end of it it was a fairly, well, an absolutely futile exercise to have to justify who we are to um, someone like Win Winshuttle and the supporters of his polemic. So I gave up teaching history and started focusing much more on my creative work. And by the way, you can get my novel Blood at 29.95 at all good bookshops at the moment. Um, <laughs> Kylie neglected to mention that. And I wrote a, no, I don't have it here. Oh. <laughs> I'm not, I was gonna bring a t-shirt, but um, um, I wrote a series of, of poems called Archive Box and I, I did four of them. And this one is probably the, I think, creatively the most successful. And it's based on working in the archive at the Victorian Public Records Office for 20 years as a, as a Koori historian. And this is an archive story where I use the actual words of both the colonial authorities who had incarcerated Aboriginal people and letters written mainly by Aboriginal women in response to their incarceration. So it's a short poem in 10 stanzas and literally the voices, the first voice is the colonial voice and the second voice is the, the Koori voice and, and we have 10 sections. So it's footnote to a history war and it's, it was archive box number two out of the four that I published. One, they are nearer white than half caste and are but idle bodies, irresponsible, hopeless and worthless. They are a drain on our goodwill, insolent and defiant. They will not respond to our kindness or our care. Two, we are sorry to trouble your souls with our sickness. We suffer influenza, typhoid and sores. We suffer our men. Also, we are late to wish you respectfully a most happy new year. Better late than never. Three, he is one pure Aboriginal man of good behaviour. He carries a rancid leg. Its cure is medicine and regular ration. He is sober and steady, a good, hard work, a good working man for a hard working day who carries a rancid leg. Four, my colour debars me, my child is dead and I am lost. We are broken into parts, our home left in the wind and it grows colder here. My wife is Aborigine, I am half caste and I am sir dutifully yours, I await your response. Five, he wears a suit, issue number six, hat, issue number seven, and possesses one pair of blankets. She has on loan one mullet net and two perch nets. Their children are gone, one influenza, one pneumonia, one ditto. Six, I am nearly bootless and my colour is a curse. I am too white and too dark. I am to be recommended within subunit four, subfile three, for license renewal. I am to be approved by you via certificate number 71, here with, within this body, within me, within me. Seven, in the name of the Lord, we are servants of Christ, called as apostles to him. Praise be the Lord and the gospel of God, the word of the testament. Brothers and sisters of the dark races at prayer with Christ, become pure in the Lord. Amen. Eight, we are in need of one flannel, one blanket, towel, hat and wire, one shirt white, one trouser working, one tweed suit, needle and cotton, one nightdress, one underwear. We are, of course, obliged. Nine, I desire to report a half-caste child, five years of age, passed away, three o'clock it was just yesterday, a whooping cough, cerebral phlegm and bronchitis. She died in the service of His Majesty. 10. I seek with words your gratitude and kindness to see my wife and children across the still water. I seek to touch my daughter's skin and heart. This is all I seek from you. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you so much to begin um, by hearing, of course, from your work, your words. Well done. Um, and I'm very moved and, and um, you know, I think you, we should all feel very honoured to have actually um, heard those works. Okay, so where to from here? Now, you've, you've, of course, you've all introduced and, and um, explained just a little bit about um, the work 
that you've presented today. But I guess I want to go delve a bit deeper, poets. <laughs> Kim, Kim, you actually wrote that you, your work is um, about issues that are faced by all Indigenous people. Is that, um, is that a pressure that you feel that you need to write? Why, why do you feel that you need to write um, your poems anything in that way? That Anything that bothers me or I have issues about or I have feelings about, I usually sit down and just write. <laughs> so, um, a lot, yeah, so it's, I just sit and write and it just comes together. So, innately a political statement? Well, it's about me, it's about yeah. things that affect my family, it's about things that affect my other extended family friends that I have. Um, so it's about things that also affect me. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's why I get a little bit nervous when I'm reading them. I'm okay standing up and talking about anything else. <laughs> but because it's my things, yeah. And you spoke a bit about, um, of course, um, your words were um, performed by titters and and your the, the beginnings of I guess yeah the beginnings of me actually having my poetry pieces of work my writing out there in public um, I've written I think since I was little just writing stuff because I love writing but um, it wasn't until Lou had sat down and put music to it Lisa started talking at me about putting my words out there and I ended up in the 90s in cafes reading with Tony. <laughs> um, it was my first time, eh, Tony? <laughs> so, just after I gave up drinking. Yeah, just... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was an amazing time. It, <laughs> See, he heard my words and give up drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can you speak a little bit about that, either, um, or all of you, I guess, like um, in the the... 90s, 80s? 90s. No, early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah, yeah, it was early right. 90s. Yeah. And, you know, I can remember being dragged around to pubs to listen to poetry. I mean, does it happen now? I haven't done it before. Um, <coughs> I'm sure, yeah, well, it does happen. There's a really um, strong poetry scene in Melbourne. Because I publish mostly <laughs> fiction, I, I probably read about once a year. So I, I don't do as much poetry reading. Usually during Reconciliation Week, um, Yelchi's here, we, we've often done um, a reading at La Mama in May or June. Um, but I think there's a, another point I'd want to re relate to what Kim says. Um, Etchings bring out a, an annual um, edition called Etchings Indigenous, and I'm, they've both been in this, and it's a great journal because it has fiction, poetry, um, visual work, graphics, and yeah, you, you might hear those debates about oh, why does it have to be a special issue about Indigenous work? You know, why aren't you just a poet or why aren't you just a writer? And I get this a lot because a lot of my fiction, people who read it who didn't know me, they, might, they often won't spot a black fella issue in it. And what people don't get is when I'm asked to do stuff with black fellas and do stuff like etchings, it's just the um, joy of doing a collaboration with people you respect and it is making a statement, this is us. Yeah. I want to step up here and say this is a whole group of you know, Aboriginal writers, photographers, and be part of that. So it's not some sort of um, you know, uh, um, affirmative action, or it's not something of this, yeah, they, they, we've got to do something special for them because they're dependent, or we've got to give them a leg up. For me, it's working with an amazing group of people and being lucky to do it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when, I'll, I'll pick on Fiona once more because we did buy, I think, 27 jackets in Berlin one day at an op shop and I had to get an extra bag to take them home. But I, I remember when I went to Berlin with Fiona and there was a few other black fellows there, how, my, how important it is to have that sort of sense of um, comradeship. And that's why, for me, when I want to write about specifically Aboriginal issues, it's firstly to talk to an Aboriginal audience and be recognised by them. It's, a, it's, it's an absolute privilege. Um, okay. So that's, who do you write for? Mm. And so, Kim? Money. Kim. <laughs> it's good. <kind of. laughs> who do you write for? 
Oh. <laughs> I guess um, I write for myself first to get my feelings down. Um, but I also write for the broader audience now, once it's like because my words are out there. So I do write for everyone else. Um, my poems have been used in schools. Um, the last one that I, I wrote is actually used with the Strongest Smarter Team um, up at Queensland Uni. Um, the Spirit of the Winter Tree has been put behind such documentaries as Sister Inside. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's for everybody. For an Aboriginal audience? An Aboriginal, yeah. To be first and foremost? or For, just First yeah. and foremost, okay. yes. Johnny? Oh, well, um, probably for, for me it's, it's always been therapeutic, so I suppose I'm just like my own psychologist. <laughs> um, it's not working. It's yeah, not yeah. working. No. <laughs> you need to be more prolific. <laughs> but yes, yeah, but, but no, look, I started writing um, when I was about probably 13. And it was, I mean, Janine is here. Um, we grew up in a suburb where we were there, like. Sister. Sorry, my sister. We grew up in a suburb where, well, we were the only black family for a long distance when we went out to Laylaw, and they were still being subdivided from farmland when we moved out there. And, um, and just, I suppose that, in a sense, that isolation of me and my brother, the only two black kids in the school at um, Laylaw Primary School, and, and I think that sense of isolation, I and mean, you're feeling all these things, but there's no one really around that you can talk about them to. And also, it was very much a, you know, very much a suburb. Like everyone played footy and cricket. And, and stuff, and so if you write, you're basically a bit effeminate. <laughs> so, so I used to write things and just hide them in my room and stuff, put them under my bed and stuff, and you know, making up poems in the shower, reciting them to myself. But um, so re I, really, it was about that uh, overcoming that sense of isolation and stuff. And um, you know, I, I felt like I didn't have much in common with anyone except myself. So I just, just talked to myself, and that's, that's why I'm clinically insane today. I think. <laughs> So, yeah, for me, a lot of it was just therapeutic. Um, but then as I got older, you know, like Tony and I, um, Pio, it was Pio, wasn't it? Pio um, is a famous Melbourneian uh, Greek poet, and he, he, he um, helped start the Fitzroy Poets Collective, which, um, which roped Tony and I in, um, I don't know how many years ago that was, um, 20, 23 years ago, and, uh, and we started reading with him. And that was the first chance I got to actually read poetry out loud, apart from to myself. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I mean Tony, we did we used to do the sort of the Rochester and the Baker's Cafe and the um, Perseverance and the, all these pubs, and um and that and that, that was sort of for me that was even another level of um, freedom because all of a sudden I could actually tell other people how I felt um, about issues, and then I got, started talking more political stuff rather than just about me, 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 me stuff. And, um, and then it sort of t took me on another level and I broadened it out and then I started realising you've got a bit of responsibility because you're, you're getting older and the, you know, the, kids, the kids are listening and there's not many black kids writing poetry and I thought, well, this is a good way to inspire them. Um, and, and so I just kept doing that and then I got published. This thing I was reading it from is a... <laughs> doesn't look like a book. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I lost the book, but luckily I got photocopies. <laughs> <laughs> So that got published in '94, and um, and that was, you know, that was it was pretty successful. We, I think we sold 2,000 copies or something, um, and that, and that sort of then, you know, when you get published um, in whatever way it, it is, big or small, I think it, it gives you a lot of confidence, and so that gives you more confidence to think, oh well, I must be doing something okay because people are paying 15 bucks to listen to this. <laughs> <You> know, <so. laughs> and then from then I just kept going, and, and that's is it, is it, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember a, um, actually a little insight. Remember when um, I think it was Pio said, "You don't have to rhyme." <laughs> remember that? Oh yeah. <laughs> and what a revolution it was! It I guess, was. It was, it was a real release yeah. of. Because I always thought poetry had to rhyme. <laughs> and of course, like, that's what you were taught. Like, in well, I know. There's not only so many words that rhyme with abo, you know. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> So I, 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 it was a real release of freedom because I didn't have to rhyme anything. And um, as you hear from some of those poems, and not many of them rhyme, you know, at all. But the early ones, like the uni days, one that was about Tony and I were at Melbourne Uni, and you were there, you were working there. Um, that that rhymed because that was before someone told me it doesn't have to rhyme anymore. Hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that, that's interesting when Johnny's talking about doing stuff together and, and people like Pi is that I reckon when, we, when you start taking your work more seriously, I found that there were really strong influences and um, the archive box, that poem, um, I went to North America, to, to Los Angeles, and I got to read with a Native American guy, Simon Ortiz, who is very famous in the States and had, had published a wonderful book called At Sand Creek, which was both about contemporary Native American men who'd been Vietnam vets and come back and been put in terrible institutions, in psychiatric institutions, but also historical poems which used archival material. And that got me thinking about how to use the colonial documentation and make it speak for Aboriginal people. And the other one in Australia, um, the other, the true history of Berwick, which is number three of this, which is a poem about William Barrick, I'd been reading Sam Wagon Watson's prose poems um, from a wonderful book of his called Smoke Encrypted Whispers, which is just, and he has these beautifully framed prose poems. And when I read those, it was another way of saying, okay, this is how I want to do this piece. So I think that what has happened to Aboriginal writers in Australia is that as you do more work and as the profile has, has risen, there's been a lot of connection and influence from both other Indigenous writers in Australia and Indigenous writers globally, which is really important to, to find ways, for me, to find ways of saying what I wanted to say that connected up with Aboriginal people in Australia and, and in the case of Simon, with Native American writers, because there's a very strong correlation of you know, the, the dormitory system in the US of locking kids up in a dormitory system is very similar to what happens here. So. Um, I like that sort of global connection, which has been really good. And we brought Simon out here after that, and he read in Melbourne, which was fantastic. Do you um, collaborate with um, other art forms? Yeah. You, I'm pointing to you. Um, Tony, photographers, yeah. and can you talk a bit about that? Um, well, probably I do a lot of that stuff. I've do, I mean, Whitefellas as well. Um, there's a young um, Gabba artist, fantastic artist, Tom Nicholson, who I... I, I the same philosophy of the, the History Wars stuff. After all that debacle, I was spending a lot of energy debating these people and it was, I think, getting blackfellas nowhere. And when you look at, and again, when I looked at work of people like Fiona Foley was doing and think, well, they're actually confronting colonial history in a, in a different way, much more creative, much more forward looking than getting stuck in this debate, which whitefellas like you get stuck in because it's like being on a treadmill. And Tom Nicholson's a young Melbourne artist who's done a lot of critique of colonialism in, in Melbourne. So we've done two, we did an exhibition at Art Space in Sydney in January last year. We did one in Adelaide and we're going to do stuff at Corindrick coming up. Um, and I found, here's a young white fellow who's in his 30s, he's energetic, he's, he wants to do stuff that, you know, is very energetic, so I just felt it was more energising. But um, Ricky Maynard and I worked together on a wonderful book um, of his photographs, and I wrote an introductory essay and the captions with the images. And that was a remarkable project because I had loved Ricky's work, and I was actually inhibited by how could I put anything at the bottom of a photograph of his that did anything like justice mm -hmm. to it. And Ricky was so generous. We. I love taking photos, so I sort of hounded him for about three weeks talking about chemicals and light and folding around the city like a shadow. And then I said to him, I'm really, I don't know if I can do the words to do justice. And he said he'd been thinking, I don't know if I could take photos to do justice to the words. So that's how generous he love was. Love fest. So w working with people like, like Ricky um, and doing the work when I did some work at the museum, I reckon it's that... Not only is it creatively productive, it's that, and this might sound, well, I don't think it should sound odd to any black fellas here. When I was involved in that History Wars debate, at the end of it, I thought, I'm going mad here. This is a, this is a, a this is not an intellectual debate. It's a, it's a really negative, um, discriminatory, disrespectful way of talking about Aboriginal people. And you start to get worn down by it. And when you do collaborations, and Vernon Arkey and I have talked about this. I wrote a long poem to one of his works on William Barrack here that I performed at the um, National Gallery, 
when you work in a collaborative sense, particularly with Aboriginal people, but again, white fellows who want to go forward and do stuff, you actually think, no, I'm not going mad because these people want to do productive work. And um, um, Ponch Hawks, I mean, if I look at her, you know, she, she gave me, I don't know, sort of strange insult. She said, I saw your photograph in a magazine. It was a terrible photograph, so I have to take your picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, but the thing about for blackfellas is that by doing collaboration with both other blackfellas and whitefellas, you don't have to pay attention and get stuck with these regressive sort of types. You can actually get on and do stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that's why working with Johnny and Janina has always been that way. They, you can enjoy what you're doing rather than be worn down by it. Mm. Yeah, Wayne Atkinson talked about if you're always answering back to white fellas, it's like a bushfire and every time you put out a spot fire, another one starts up, so you try and put that out and in the end you're just exhausted. You have no control. Yeah, and you, get, and you know, you see black fellas in high profile positions, you just see how they get burnt out by mm. the process because they're not looked after and they've got to take on all these battles and it, it just wears people out. Hmm. So in a way, you artists are very lucky, aren't you? Very protected in a way. Because you can say what you want. And, <laughs> and then I guess that's what poetry is about. Um, you know, as, as a non-poet, as someone who can hardly string two sentences together, I'm actually in awe of, of um, such wordsmiths. Um, and, and you talk about how, you, how therapeutic it is and how you have to do it. Do you... Do you um, write prolifically? What do you do? Well, I write when I can, but because my life gets so busy with both my job and my family, I, I don't get as much time as I want or I, I need to. Um, yeah, so I write when I can, um, when it gets too much and I've got to get it out. Yeah. And, and in your other life, what are you? Beg yours. Ms. Walker, what's your work? Um, I coordinate the Indigenous Unit, Jimbaya Bunjal, at La Trobe University in Bendigo. Oh, is that all? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. There's I just chase after all the students. Yeah. Now. <laughs> and of course, there's a mother and a... A mother, yes. And a grandmother. And a granny. Yeah. And um, yes, and grandson's taking up a lot of time. <laughs> Although we sit and sing and make up our own little songs. Oh, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> Another poet, hopefully. Yes, mm. but I do need to apologise to Fiona Foley. I didn't realise she was sitting there as another Bachelor member. I did have a poem <laughs> on Fraser Island, so I'll share it with you later. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. And Johnny? You could have Fiona up here. She's giving more attention than what I <laughs> Oh, what was the question? Uh, you know, poetry, is it a burning yes. desire that you have to... Yeah, to I do. Oh, yeah. of course you're a, you know, you're a, a, a playwright and, you know, we have yeah. poetry... Oh, I write a lot, that. but, I mean, play, playwriting is probably um, more, I suppose, a professional passion, whereas this is more just like a private passion okay. um, that I ended up starting to read to people. <laughs> but I, it wasn't ever intended to be read to people, it was just, um, like I said, therapeutic. Um, whereas playwright, you know, someone comes and commissions you and whatever, or you get an idea and you try and flog it to a theatre company, but um, it's a bit different with poetry. I don't ever have the desire to flog my poetry to anyone. It's more about just therapeutic. It's like I said, you know, it's like my psychologist in, in between two bits of cardboard. You do you write <laughs> poems for other people too? Yeah, you know, I, write, I, I dedicate poems to a lot of... Every poem I've written is dedicated to someone, <laughs> even in the book, at top of every... Even for you, Kylie, there's one. <laughs> and... and <laughs> And, and for my daughter, where Sophia is here somewhere, um, oh, she's at the front desk. Um, I, there's a poem. There's a poem dedicated to her. So each, every poem I write is, is usually I want I dedicate it to someone because it's like, not that it, they've always inspired the poem, but it's like you write, start writing a poem and you think of them and you think, oh, they'd like this poem or it's a little bit of them in this poem or something. So it's always it's connected to somebody each poem, um, and, and more generally it's connected to our black people, our sisters, you know, I, I write poems just for black women, I write poems that are just for black men, just for black children, um, some even for white people. <laughs> you know, so, so, I write for everybody really. Yeah, yeah you do. <laughs> and um, with an educative slant always? Yeah, uh, look, I've, I've been, I've copped a bit of flack sometimes because I've writ written poems criticising our own communities, you know, about, you name it, you know, corruption, mismanagement, um, 
you know, greed, um, and, and you read them out, and then someone will come up and go, you know, it wasn't about me, was it, brother? <laughs> <laughs> I go, no, don't be silly. So yeah, that, that's I call that edu edu educative <laughs> as well, educative as well. But I, I do write for kids a lot. I mean, a lot of times I want kids to, you know, I like to record things, like you know, um, document things. So kids, because some some things I write about, they're not happening anymore. You know, like there's a lot less anger <laughs> I find in today's world than the, there was 20 years ago, and um, there's a, too much complacency. So I, I I often write to make people document it and make people realise. Um, that, you know, we're all sitting in here today because people marched out there yesterday, you know, this mm. wouldn't even be happening. So um, I, a lot of that's to, um, to remind people that, um, you know, it's all, it's all fat and floss and feathers now, but it wasn't like that. And a lot of people died to get us sitting in this mm. theatre today. So mm. uh, it's educative. Edumacative. Um, I guess, thank you so much. Is there, um, uh, I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions, if that's all right, if you've got burning questions to ask. <laughs> you hearing the story as a child, and then you got another layer of the story as you were, got, got a bit bigger, and it kept you coming back to the community because you had to hear the next, next layer down. And I've always hung out to find out a story like that. I would love, love you to either tell us or to write about it sometime. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll write, it's, it's a bit of a long yarn. I'll write about it. I'll, it'll be in my next novel that me and Tony are collaborating on He's not together. A no. <laughs> like, I'm not a visual artist by any means, um, but I actually work uh, in the School of Art at RMIT. And this, this guy asked me to, um, one of the senior staff, because uh, we have a lot of um, international students, you know, it's the backbone of the money of RMIT's international students and they had this Korean high school class and they all came over and he said, can you give them a tour of the Ian Potter Centre in the Aboriginal section? And I'm like, me? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even draw a dot. <laughs> a dot painting. And so, I, so I did a bit of research and then the, so I read this interview, I can't remember who it was, I, I was a bit nervous and I just tried to do some research and this old fellow said um, in this interview that when you're young, you look at this painting, I'm talking about like a traditional painting, a dot painting or something, and when you're young, you understand it on one level. When you get a bit older, you read more into it, and then when you get old enough, you can actually, you're allowed to know, you know what every bit, what it's really about. And, and I just thought, wow, because I never, I didn't know that myself about painting, uh, traditional paintings and stuff. And, and then I thought, oh, that's what I do with, that's what I do with words is that I'll come up with a little, you know, an idea, a phrase, and then it might be years later, I'll turn it into a poem, and then I turned it into a play, and that was up the road. It started as a poem and, and an idea, because um, this black fella said, he was a black bureaucrat, and um, he used to wear pinstripe suits, and I thought it was really cool. And, um, <laughs> but, but he used to say that, you know, um, it's so hard, because if the black man's happy, in my job as a black bureaucrat, if the black community's happy, then the boss is angry. If the boss is happy, the blacks are angry. <laughs> and I thought that is so true. <laughs> and out of that came up the road. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, as writers, I read a comment by Maya Angelo recently. She was talking about her beautiful poem, Prayer for Peace. And she said that it wouldn't let her sleep till she got it down. And I'm wondering, as writers, do you ever feel that sometimes pieces have their own spirit that need to be put down because I'm trying to write sometimes it feels like that mm -hmm. yeah. and that spirit will yeah. revisit me and add more and want me to edit do you ever feel that and would you like to Definitely. comment on that um, yeah often I suppose to be to be exact about it when I wrote the the Beric poem um, two things that that you you talk about which which would be relevant is that I couldn't write the poem first thing unless I walked the river because it was a poem about the river and it was a poem about Wurundjeri attachment to the river. And when I did the walk, I, I did feel that incredibly intense emotional reaction, but also physical. I, you know, I try and explain this to students I teach writing to and they think I'm crazy, but I get a sort of a tingling in my arms and I'm a fingertip, so I was so excited about having to write it. And then when I was doing the research, um, there's a, a Wurundjeri word, Namajet, and Whitefellas always th thought it referred to 
to whitefellas because they were being called Namajet by the Wurundjeri when they first met them. But when I did further research, what it was, it, Namajet is not a word for whitefellas, it's a, it's a word for colour and the colour red and various versions of it like sunset, like the ochres that were put on um, Wurundjeri dead after um, they had passed. But also because the reason they call whitefellas Namajet is because they're often sunburnt, so they're red. And when I got that connection that you had this multi-meaning for one simple word, that was the point where not only couldn't I sleep until I started the poem, for the whole journey of that poem, which is quite a long poem, I was almost in a hyper state of thinking, I'm not going to get it right. And I, I thought, if I can't get this poem right, I'm, I'll feel really gutted. So for the whole period of writing that poem and doing the redrafts, that's exactly how I felt, this intense need and responsibility to, to do it, but also to, to get it right. It's the same for me. When I, I start writing, it can change. It changes shape. Um, and I'll put it down and then I'll pick it back up and start again and there'll be words all over and then it'll just come together. Just the same as what Tony and, and Kim, 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 Kim said. Um, <laughs> but um, it, I, I, always, I always compare it to, um, not that I'm a woman, but I always compare it to pregnancy. Um, <laughs> <Don't> I, just, <laughs> I do, because I, I just, it's, it's like um, um, it's a burning desire. It's like a pregnancy, and it's like when, when I release it, and I get, like Tony said, and you get it right, and you spit it out, or you vomit it out, I call it, vomiting it out, and then you feel so much better, and, and um, then I, um, I, I just want to actually show someone now. I just want to go, look, at, check this out, because I've, it's like I've, I've released an emotional happiness, and I'm, I'm wrapped. And then, and so, but until I get that, I, I can even keep you awake at night, you know, um, and that's why I'll, I'll often get up. I don't know about you two, but I'll often um, get, up, get up at three in the morning and just scribble a note down, because I know in the morning I won't remember it, and then sometimes it's the beginning of a poem. So. Just wondering, is it a conscious decision when you start writing to write a poem or a book, or do you let the inspiration actually help you take that shape? Like, you might think it might be a poem and then it turns into a book or a novel or whatever. Yeah, that's a really good question because I started off doing poetry, but I've written mostly short stories in the novel since. But um, you do know that a certain idea links to a way, it's about how you're going to communicate it and there are certain projects that a poem is the only way and usually it's one that, that it's more direct but two you can play with words in a way that well I, I can't play with in fiction and I actually do, when I talked about that word Namajet it really suits a, a, a Koori indigenous consciousness about the ability to take one word and to play around with it in, in different ways because this is obviously what Wurundjeri were doing and sometimes um, I just take photos and for me that's, that's so private, no one would exhibit my photos but um, I'll see something I just feel like I want to take a picture and then when I take the picture then I think well I want to make a word picture and that's why I was attracted to Sam Wagon Watson's work, if you ever see Sam's work he has these prose poems and they're like frames, they're a block and I reckon that's the connection between, I reckon he's writing words, pictures, it's almost you can imagine someone taking the snapshot and that's what it looks like, a, a lovely frame. Mm. And I, sorry, and yeah, I, 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 um, I don't think I've ever like, like I was saying before, if I write a little line and it's, it's just like, uh, sometimes it's just a play on words and it's just like turning the white man's language and you know, like um, I, I saw this milk carton and it said on it, pasteurised. And I, when I was young, and, I, and it was the first poem I ever wrote, it was called Pasteurised, but I, I turned it into past your eyes. And, um, and then that became the poem. Um, so sometimes I'll just write something, you know, and then it becomes a poem. A, a one line will kick off a poem, but also one line will kick off a play as well. You know, like that, um, like, like, again, that, to use the example of Up the Road, um, I, I, this, um, this fellow said to me, black fellow, he was in New South Wales actually, uh, in Sydney, and um, he, he said to me the term up the road, because um, I, didn't, I didn't have that, that name, and he, he said that years and years ago, long before I wrote the play, and I, I, I said to him, where is Newtown? And Rhoda can relate to this. Where is Newtown? And he said, it's just up the road. And I was in Bondi, and I thought I could walk there. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm in the city and I must I stop a I stop a uh, man in the city. And I said, "Where's Where's Newtown?" He said, "Stop the road." And I, 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 
I must have walked for an hour. And, um, and I just thought, but wasn't that interesting? Like, um, black fellas always say that, and white fellas always say that. And it's like a, an optimistic, I find it really optimistic. It's like, you know, it's not far, you'll be right. Stop the road. And so I find it very positive and, and optimistic, you know. Whereas if you, you know, if, if you were negative, you'd be going, oh, you can't, it's a long way. Ah, forget it. <laughs> you know? So that, that started, for me, that started me thinking about, you know, and I, I ended up, we called the play up the road and Kylie directed it. Um, but so yeah, that came from one, you know, one little, one little sentence from a stranger, you know. So you never know what you're going to write, I think. But I think if you're a true artist, like the man who just asked his question is one of the best choreographers in the country. And I'm sure that you, you, when you create a dance, sometimes you haven't got the complete dance in your head. You make it, you just keep making it up, don't you? And it's the same with a poem or a play or a movie, film, whatever, I think. Don't you think? Don't you think? Yeah. Mm. Well, I think a poem is very special because you aren't working with the visual. I mean, I loved it when you said close your eyes because that's actually what you do. Oh. Like, you, you, you go somewhere else. Mm. And, and it's your amazing words that do that. So thank you very much. Please continue to make us go somewhere else. Please put your hands together for these amazing poets. Um, Kim Walker, John Harding, Tony Birch, thank you so much. <laughs>